Chris, you're more than welcome to continue singing with us. We're about to start our preludes. Salvation 
joy, my righteousness, and I love I'm going to have the call to worship for you here in a moment uh, from Psalm 104. The key words are these, you will hear, O oh Lord my God, you are very great. And that is why we're here to worship. And if, if you're like me, I'm a pastor and I need to focus. And I bet you're like me and you need to focus on a Sunday morning. And that is our focus as we start to say, you are great, Lord. You really are. You are great. So let us focus on that. If you're able to stand, please stand to hear the reading of God's word in Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. Let us worship this God who is truly very great. Oh, the majesty. 
in his letter to the Ephesians. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Good morning again to everyone and to those online as well. Um, well, those receiving the offering, uh, please come forward. And this is a day, actually, at the end of the service, we need to complete our corporation meeting to approve the budget. It's worth saying something about uh, the offerings and tithes here that I know you give, whether here in the plate or online. A uh, number of times I, I try to remind people that when you give, when the Moser household gives, uh, we are not just trying to give to new life. The bigger thing is you're trying to give to the Lord. 
right? This is, this is giving to the Lord, and we try to disperse these funds in a way that glorifies the Lord, keeping that in mind, and, and hopefully the budget reflects that today. This is our prayer. So as I go into the prayer here for the offering, it's not just that we would see this as giving to the Lord, worship, but also as a church, that we would do well with the funds that the Lord has given us. So let us pray. Father, we do pray for those two things. Let our hearts be joyous in worship to give back to you and to your kingdom, to your priorities, Lord. We do as we put money into the baskets or give online. Lord, teach our hearts to give to you. And as a church here, as a body, Lord, we want to do with these funds as you please, Lord. Not as what we would do, but as you would please. Help us to do that more and more every year and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me say about prayer here, uh, please ask someone if you need prayer after the service to pray for you. Might be someone in your aisle. Don't be afraid to do that. Or up front here on, on, on my right here, we'll have someone at the end of the service uh, to pray with you, although the end of the service is a little uh, different today with a corporation meeting for five minutes. Uh, but we'd love to pray for you. There's cards on the side, and you can mark whether you want the whole staff to pray for you or just me if it's something more uh, private. We, we're here to pray for you. Um, I just have a few things to announce. Um, more complete information is in the bulletin. And if you don't get the church email, uh, please look at the bulletin. You can have a couple email addresses of staff. You can email us and say, hey, how do I get on the email list to find out what's going on in the church? This is what I want to have time to highlight today. Number one, the budget for the fiscal year 2023 starts real soon in July. And so that's our meeting for five minutes after the service. And that is for, just so you know, those meetings, according to uh, uh, our Presbyterian Church in America and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh, that is for those who are members of the church and 18 years uh, or older. So please be uh, able to stay. If you can, for five minutes, it'll be real quick. And everyone else can, can feel free to leave when the service is done. Thank you. If you are new to New Life or somewhat new, uh, you actually have an opportunity. Last second here, we have a luncheon in the library after this service, some of you have already signed up for it, uh, but if you'd like to meet the staff, that's me and a number of others who are on staff here, we'd love to meet you in the library and talk with you, eat something, and uh, so that's just uh, today as soon as, as soon as the corporation meeting is done. I want to thank Matt Knox, uh, too. He is helping us out with the July 4th parade, which is just about upon us, and let me just give a little blurb here. Uh, if you can volunteer, we actually have a number of volunteer roles. It's not just uh, following what used to be the floating out in the minibus, following the minibus in the parade and handing out the ice pops, which I love to do. There's actually other things that you can volunteer for. We have a number of, of tasks. So if you could contact Matt Knox, if you're interested in all his contact information is in the bulletin, we really could use some help. We love the July 4th parade and being a part of it. All church prayer meeting, uh, if you haven't been to one of these, please consider it. It's a, it's a great thing to be praying for our church, community, the world. It's coming up Sunday, July 10th. So a couple Sundays from now in the evening, please join us to pray. Lights, camera, sound, action. The tech team needs, needs new members. And what a great time to join the tech team. You might say, I don't know what we're doing. That's okay. We don't either. In that, we're moving to the sanctuary with new equipment. So there's a good amount of new equipment. There'll be new training. It's a great time to jump in if you know even a little bit or nothing about audiovisual, lighting, uh, streaming. Please uh, consider us uh, joining us. And the contact would be Eric Oschlegel or Vitaly Ford. And uh, you'll see the information in the bulletin. All right, I wanted to say goodbye. This is a bittersweet goodbye. In a few minutes, you're gonna hear uh, Kenneth Teo bring us uh, the word of God. And uh, that means that they're leaving. We just said goodbye to the SQs. Uh, this is the time of year where we have some seminary graduates who are off to serve the Lord in some kind of role in ministry. And Kenneth and Shuyan and their family have been here, Natalie and Ruel, their kids, uh, for a number of years and now returning home to Singapore. And he will be taking up a pastoral role in a church there 
Many of you have got to know, maybe, maybe you haven't got to know them personally, but a lot of you have, and they've been a real blessing, and he's going to leave us with a blessing too today, as you'll, you'll hear the sermon here in a few minutes. I'm very thankful for the Teos. I want to invite Beth Stonehouse up here to um, share a word with us. I won't steal her thunder, uh, but Beth has a deep heart for those with uh, disabilities and challenges and special needs, and she's going to share out of her heart here. We're very thankful for Beth. Good morning. For those of you that don't know me, um, I'll share a little bit about myself together with my husband, Steve, and our five kids. We joined New Life a little over a year ago. Uh, we moved to this area about two years ago after living in Central Asia for about 16 years. Um, and there we were primarily involved with ministry within the health uh, medical sector. So I want to share a little bit this morning on the topic of disability. I'm not an expert, but this is just an area of life and ministry that the Lord has been moving me into over the past several years. Around 10 years ago, while we were living overseas, uh, Steve and I had the opportunity to become involved with a project to serve and equip families of children with various disabilities. Simply, it was an initiative to keep children out of institutions and at home together with their families. Um, the project was small, and the uh, government eventually shut it down. But through it, the Lord opened up many channels of relationship within the world of disability. And more importantly, he began to really stir my heart to learn more about how the church can embrace and serve families impacted by disability. So I'm using the term disability to refer to those of us who are differently abled um, in some way. Maybe people who have bodies that work differently, people who communicate differently, maybe who process the environment differently. 15% of our global population has some type of disability. Maybe you do. Maybe you have a family member who does or a neighbor. It's beautiful to consider that the Lord has a special place in the church for people with disabilities. In Romans 12, Paul says that the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division, but that the members may have the same care for one another. I was re recently watching a training video for a special needs ministry, um, and I was struck by a quote that so beautifully summarizes this passage. The church finds unity when Christ is our head, and all the diverse parts of the body are welcomed and needed. I'm going to read that again. The church finds unity when Christ is our head, and all the diverse parts of the body are welcomed and needed. I love the dual emphasis here on being both welcomed and needed. While our family was living in Central Asia, the Lord led us to adopt a, a girl with multiple disabilities. At the time, she was six. And many of you may have seen or inter interacted with our daughter, Mari, and she's now 12. Part of our journey with Mari has been to discover the ways that she is needed in the body of Christ, to recognize the gifts that she brings to the church and to um, and the ways the church um, is edified by her part participation. In a church of this size, there are many types of disabilities represented, even more in our community. Does new life accurately reflect the diversity of, of abilities in the Glenside area? Do people with various disabilities feel welcomed here, and more importantly, feel needed? I'm not up here to, pit it, to pitch a specific project, but I just want to invite you to connect with me. If, this, if your heart is stirred in some way by this type topic of disability in the church, perhaps you have some type of experience with this. Perhaps you have a family member or a neighbor that you've wanted to invite, but maybe there aren't appropriate accommodations here. I would love to brainstorm and seek the Lord together with you for the ultimate goal that new life might better glorify Christ as a diverse body made up of members with all abilities. So to connect with me, please find me after the service today or look in the bulletin. You'll see my email address in there. I think it'll be there today and, and then the, the bulletin for the next several weeks. Look forward to seeing what the Lord has in mind for us. Thanks.
Let's pray a moment. Lord, we do pray for this area of ministry, Lord, where you have called us to care for those who are disabled and for those who uh, have special needs and challenges. We pray. I pray now, Lord, that if you're moving or would you move in in the hearts of the saints here uh, to consider what more we could do. I think finally of the friendship class that we had here for so many years, and we miss the presence of those folks. And uh, Lord, if you move anyone, help them to connect with Beth, I pray, and that something fruitful would come from this. In Jesus' name, amen. I just got to say, personally, it's been an inspiration to see some of you over all these years we've been here, and Lisa and I have been here 20 years, uh, and uh, just to see some of you have uh, given your life to taking care of those with special needs. And it's a, it's a long journey, a beautiful journey, a hard journey, and we've really been inspired to see that. And uh, what a week, too, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, and to think about the most vulnerable among us, the, the unborn, and to know that they'll have a better chance of uh, seeing the light of life. Uh, it's, a, it's a great day for us to be reminded that we value all human life here, made in God's image. Well, we have a time here now to meet and greet each other, I assume. Doug and Rosemary Green are not here for the second service, too. They were here from Australia uh, earlier, so uh, sorry if you missed them. Uh, But uh, let's uh, rise and and greet everyone here. brothers and sisters <clears throat> let's let's uh, let's join together uh, as a congregation in prayer Jesus you said come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest and here we are father and we thank you that you've called us to a life worthy of being called a disciple of you Help us to be humble, completely humble and gentle, being patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through our bond of peace. Father, we pray for the lost and broken who do not have this hope. Uh, We pray that as we interact with them, with our lives and with our deeds, that they are called 
into fellowship with us and that we can call them here to worship you each week together. We pray for the elders as they meet this week uh, to make decisions and to just oversee. We pray for the deacons and the deaconesses as they continue to lead us in works of mercy. We thank you for their tireless effort. Remember the pastoral staff also, and we ask and we raise them up to you. We also remember those who are in leadership in various organizations like Bob and Nancy Osborne with Surge and Karen and Mike Masso, Mark and Susan Davis, and Piper and Andy Fordham. The Herons uh, and Allison with Frontiers and the Selingers. We also remember those who are involved uh, with local education and diaconal ministries like Jill Page. She does such a great work, Father. We thank you for her. We thank you for Harold and Sarah Shepian also and continue to bless them in their work. And we also remember those who are raising funds like Julia Kuklo. Uh, we pray that you provide those for her. Remember people in our congregation um, I just pray for Elia Bow with her upcoming surgery. Calm her heart. We ask that this surgery does what it's supposed to do. Remember Toby DeMoss and his long battle with the illness. Father, I, there's a lot of medical treatment. We just pray for healing. We pray for deliverance. We remember the women in our congregation who are pregnant. Um, and we are, uh, we pray for their, um, their protection and the protection of the unborn within them. We thank you so much that uh, you brought Margo uh, to Josh and B. Galloway uh, this past week or last Saturday. Um, and we just continue to uh, remember those who are pregnant, like Nikki Bay and Alicia Sue. Uh, who are t scheduled to deliver uh, this summer. We thank you so much for the gift of children. We also remember those who are on the other side of the birth spectrum, which is uh, the grieving of a, of a lost one, like Kathy Wilson, her mother who passed away a week ago, and Gwen Ennis, her mother who passed away yesterday. Uh, be in their hearts, Father. Help them to be able to grieve well. We pray for those also who struggle with mental health issues and chronic conditions and the caregivers who work with them over and over. I pray that people will connect with Beth about um, this disabilities things or people with abilities. I, I just want to represent you well, Father. And I ask that you help us use our, our gifts in the right way. And Father, I'm going to pray for Ken and his wife and his kids. They will be leaving us, but um, I pray that their ministry is super fruitful. Yeah. Um, and I pray that our hearts are open to hear his message as he's going to bring it to us today. In your son's name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. So this morning I'm going to do something that I don't normally do. Normally when I preach a sermon, I have the entire manuscript typed out, every word I'm going to say. Today, notes free. <laughs> and it's because I want to enter into this moment with you. I, I want to look at you. I don't want to be stuck up staring at my notes. So this is our last Sunday here, um, I need you to know that we'll miss you very much and that we love you. And one of the hardest things that I've had to do in my preparation as I walk through John chapter 17 is just realizing that I'm not going to be able to watch your children grow up, I'm not going to be able to be at your bedside when you're sick or in the hospital. And that's hard, and, and, and that's, that's loss. 
for us. But this passage has been such a comfort in the midst of that. I was sharing with some friends before the first service that our time here has, has been a kind of microcosm of, of a life lived. In international student years, I'm maybe pushing 80 <laughs> at this point. It's almost time to go. <laughs> yeah, and what a life it's been. What a life it's been and what a privilege it's been to, to spend this life with you. Now, uh, yeah, and the slides go on, please. Yeah, we'll be looking at John chapter 17, focusing on verses 1 through 5, but uh, I'm going to be reading the whole of, of the passage, okay? And I'm going to do that in, in just a bit. Okay, it looks like we'll have to switch the slides manually again. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, I, I understand some of you uh, don't yet know us. Uh, this is me and my family, uh, Natalie, Kenneth, Shu Yan, and Ruel. And on the next slide, you'll see where we come from. Okay, we come from the tiny island state in Southeast Asia called Singapore. And uh, it's marked by that yellow arrow. It's so small, you can't even see it. There's like a, a star there, okay? Uh, so Singapore is not China. You see China is this big thing up here. We look Chinese, many of us, we're not. It's like, uh, you know, we are as Chinese as many of you here are British. <laughs> it's like that, okay? Uh, there's been a lot of water under the bridge as the, as the saying goes, okay? Uh, how small are we? We are one-third the size of Long Island. That's how small we are. So it's as if, uh, you know, if New York City were a country, uh, in terms of size, that, that, that's about uh, how big we are. Okay, and that's the flight that we're going to take. This is the flight that we're going to take. New York and Singapore are diametrically opposite one another. So it's literally halfway across the world. This is the longest flight that, that you can take, 19 hours. Uh, so do be praying for us. Do be praying for journeys, mercies. As you can see, you know, we're, we're flying over the North Pole where it's narrow, and then we're going down south through, through Russia. Yeah, so do be praying for uh, journeys, mercy. Yeah. And like I was saying, you know, the thought of, of leaving you guys has been difficult, and, and it's been so precious to me to be able to read through John chapter 17, to listen to the words of our great high priest as he gives this high priestly prayer. And these words that we're about to read in Scripture speak into these pastoral realities. I don't want to be melodramatic, you know, we're, we're not leaving the planet, we're, we're leaving <laughs> country. So my, what I've just described falls within not so traumatic but very significant. Um, in the preceding section to the high priestly prayer, Jesus is comforting his disciples at uh, the reality that he's about to, to leave for the cross, but he reminds them that their sorrow will turn to joy. And, and this speaks into all these hard realities that we face as the church of, of Christ living in a fallen world. You know, there's very traumatic experiences of separation and loss, forced dislocation. Our brothers and sisters in Ukraine are experiencing that as a visceral reality. Uh, isolation and ostracization. Uh, John brings consolation to that. First and foremost, if you're experiencing that for the sake of Jesus Christ, if you're experiencing that for being a Christian, but, you know, even if in a general way you're being isolated, bullied in some way, these words speak comfort to you as well. Speak comfort to those in the midst of relational estrangement, major illness, and death. And there's also other kinds of uh, things that we experience which uh, don't get maybe as much airtime. Maybe they're not the technicolor kinds of suffering, uh, to use an expression uh, that David Powlison used to use a lot. But 
you know, still very significant. Things like uh, moving across the country for, for work, work relocation, graduations, just you know, the experience of growing up, moving from one phase of life to another. And there's, there's loss involved in that. And we want to be sensitive to that as well. So our passage today speaks into all these difficult realities with a penetrating note of hope. This passage gives us panorama. We just came out of that, of that series, right? This, this uh, passage today gives us a panoramic perspective with which to face all these losses. Uh, gives us panoramic perspective to face loss in a world where loss is endemic because of the fall. Okay. And... Yeah, I want to set some of the context for, for our passage today, okay? And as I do this, it might strike some of you as being maybe nerdy. <laughs> maybe this takes you back to high school where you had a really pedantic high school English teacher and you're like, oh man, this guy, man, and you were never good enough for him. And I, I'm sorry if that's what you experienced. I was an English teacher before, so there's an occupational hazard. <laughs> Okay, but why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up to demonstrate just the principle I hope to evince in our time here, that when we talk about biblical literacy, we want to do more than just that. We want to do more than just understand the words on, in the Bible, but we want to recognize the biblical intimacy involved, what's happening when we open our Bibles and God is speaking to us, He's relating to us. And all that we're doing now is doing... You know what we would do as good conversation partners to our friends and loved ones? Asking the question, am I, am I hearing you right? Is this what you mean? I want to emphasize the things that, that you want to emphasize. I want to catch what you really want to say to me. And, and as I orientate us to the context, that's all we're trying to do, okay? We're trying to get plugged in, in relationship to our God and Savior, Okay. So the big picture context of John's gospel, the things that we read about Jesus, what are they for? Okay. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. But this belief, this trust in Christ takes place not in abstraction, but in the context of, of life experiences. And we've already seen in the upper room discourse how, how Jesus uh, consoles and comforts his, his disciples. And this is such a precious verse from, from that earlier section. John 16, 33. I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Okay, so Jesus is bringing that front and center. He knows that this is what his disciples are going to face. But and here's that, that encouraging but. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Uh, next slide. And you know what's really amazing about what we're going to read in John 17 is that what comes after that is so much suffering, so much loss, so much shame. Jesus is going to be betrayed He's going to be denied by his best friend. He's going to be mocked and he's going to be scourged. He's going to suffer incredibly. He's going to be crucified. But in John 17, his vision is on the glory ahead. His focus is on the glory of the cross, the glory that he shared even before time began with the Father and the glory that will be his when he is exalted through the resurrection, okay? So now I'm going to turn to the passage, and I hope that as we have been orientated to the pastoral context, that these words would hit home with greater force. And at the same time, this is our, our last time together, so let's think of this as a kind of family devotion, one for the road, okay? Let me read the passage for us. Turn with me 
if you will, to John chapter 17 in your pew Bibles. That's page 903, 903. John chapter 17, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So before we dive into the passage, I have an illustration to maybe help uh, make this a little bit concrete, okay? So you guys remember the Super Bowl. This is a story of how I became a Philly Eagles fan. So... It's fourth and goal, critical juncture in the Super Bowl game against that obscure team. It starts with what uh, starts with an N and ends with a New England Patriots. <laughs> <laughs> and what's really cool about this is when Nick Foles goes up and he, he asks Doug Peterson, you want Philly Philly? And what I've captured here is a moment if you blink, you'll miss it. It's a moment that I screenshot it. I left it there. It's all about two seconds, but it's a very pregnant two seconds. And it's right here. You can see them staring at each other's eyes. And I don't know, maybe I'm reading it wrong. Maybe Doug Peterson is saying, oh, you are crazy. You are out of your mind. Why did I, why did I even pick you as my quarterback? 
maybe saying that, but you know what I think I see there is I love you. I, I, I trust you. We're, we're going to do this. This is the moment. <laughs> and it, it gives you goosebumps. Just, just look at it. I get emotional <laughs> looking at this, <laughs> you know. And don't you love it when a plan comes together? Wow, easy, easy, bling, bling, kill, kill. And the last person you expect to do the touchdown, the quarterback, ends up being the one on the receiving end of a glorious pass, a glorious catch, a glorious touchdown. And Philadelphia is wrapped up in that glorious moment. You know, making an analogy from the relatively trivial as, as, you know, in the bigger picture, we all know that you know, these are, are transient things. These are not eternal things, even though we see God's common grace in, in the world around us and we appreciate his good gifts to us. That these are relatively trivial. But making an analogy from the relatively trivial to something much more profound, something, a reality that existed even before time began, the relationship between the eternal father and the eternal son and the spirit, the God hit three in one, we sang about that. And that glory, that language cannot fully express. The limits of my language cannot fully capture the beauty and the profundity of that relationship that existed even before the foundation of the world that had no beginning and has no end from eternity. And you know the cool bit is this. Uh, as much as I can identify as an adopted Phillies fan, there's a, there's a sense in which, like, this moment is between Doug Peterson and Nick Foles. It's theirs, and I'm a spectator. But the amazing thing that we see in the passage today is this relationship that we see between the Father and the Son has overflowed and spilled out and, and touched us and included us and wrapped us in that glory and I do hope that, you know, if you're coming here, you're bringing pain and struggle, that this glory would lift you from that narrow vision of strife and sorrow and struggle to a bigger panoramic perspective of the glory of the triune God and his magnificence and his grace to us and his salvation. Okay, so let's dive into the passage proper. I want you guys to look down at verses 1 and verses 4 through 5. That uh, basically describes the main content of what Jesus is preaching about. Verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And what's he talking about? If you take this out of context, he, he seems egotistical, right? It sounds like something like a narcissist would say, glorify me, I want glory. And that couldn't be further from the truth because uh, what he's talking about here is he's looking forward to what Philippians 2 writes about, what Paul writes about in that lovely hymn in Philippians 2. And that's going to be on the screen for you in just a moment. Our humble king. Look at this. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, therefore, because of this humility, because of this humble obedience as our servant king, our savior, what has God done? God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. And it continues, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So far from being the final rantings of a narcissist, this is the triumphant prayer of a humble servant king who desires all glory and praise and who deserves it. Amen? Amen. And he's not just looking forward to glory that comes 
uh, after the resurrection, after the ascension. He's looking for something uh, that he had with the Father before time began. Look again at verse 5. Now, Father, glorify me in your own presence, and only the eternal Son can say this to the eternal Father. With the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Isn't that magnificent? You know, um, the hymn, crown him with many crowns, there's an expression, ineffably sublime. What does it mean? It means there are some things that are so wonderful that, wow, it's unspeakable. It's so unspeakably glorious. My words cannot fully even capture that. And... The amazing thing then is what this glory amounts to in relation to us. So if we could uh, move, I think that's two slides. Uh, Yeah, oh, uh, one slide back, I'm sorry. What is the outcome of this inter-Trinitarian love, the love of the Father for the Son and the Son for the Father? Look down at verses 2 to 3. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The Father's purpose was redemption and the Son accomplished it. And we are wrapped up in that glory in a saving way that we could not have engineered on our own, that he reached out in grace in our darkness, in our lostness, to redeem us. And think about how Christ did that. You know, when Nick Foles caught it, instant glory. Catch him and throw him. You did it, Nick. All the plaudits and all the acclaim. But look to John 18, John 19. What happens to Jesus? Look at all the suffering that he undergoes there. And he knows it when he weeps at Gethsemane and he prays, Father, take this cup away from me, yet not my will but yours. Just because he is the God-man does not mean that he's somehow numbed or immune to the struggles of, of humans, that he was distressed at what he was going to face, yet though he was tempted, he was without sin. Look at the courage of your king, your humble king, who goes to the cross to purchase for us, his church, eternal life. So this is the panorama. This is the big picture that John 17 wants to wrap our, our vision on. Okay, What are the implications of that? Now, uh, this is a quote from uh, an ex-professor at Westminster who has since gone into glory at Clowney. <sighs> the church, according to scripture, is not a religious club. It's not a voluntary association of like-minded Christians who cultivate friendship and engage in joint projects. It is rather the institution of Christ and of the Spirit formed by his power and governed by his word. Now, when we lose sight of this panorama, this big picture of how Trinitarian glory has overflowed into the saving work of Christ and has now been applied by the work of the Spirit that brings the things of Christ and and makes it a reality in our lives. If we lose sight of that big picture, what we will turn the church into is a country club surrounded by people that are exactly like us, doing things the way we expect them to do. If not, we go and find another church. You know, uh, we end up becoming um, more reflective of the consumerist culture surrounding us than reflective of the gospel of grace that reconciles people who would normally be at enmity with one another. All right. So what's it going to be, new life? Is the word of this world going to speak more loudly and clearly? Is that what we will witness to in our relationships and in our ministries or in our lives? Will we 
testify to the grace uh, that is now at work in us by the Spirit's power. I have a few more comments about eternal life. What is eternal life? There's a misconception that eternal life is this kind of airy fairy thing. You know, you're floating on angel's wings on a cloud playing an electric harp or something like that. Uh, No, eternal life is a visceral reality that begins even now. Even now, if you are in Christ, you have been given eternal life. You have passed from death into life. And that is what Jesus says in, in John chapter 5, verse 24, that those who have believed in him have crossed from death to life. Okay? So we are not grimly holding on in the present until some undefined point in the future where finally we get it. No, you already have it. And the spirit that is now working in and amongst us is the down payment and the guarantee of that. And what does it actually mean then to know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent? Um, The overwhelming focus and emphasis of Jesus across the Gospels, across all of Scripture, which is his word because it's God's word and he's God, the overwhelming focus of knowing him is through his word, through that divine revelation that was uh, given to us at such a great cost. You know, when we think of the Bible, sometimes we think of it as mere information. And I like to think about it more, uh, more in terms of a Star Wars analogy. You know, the plans for the Death Star? You watch Rogue One? All, the, all those good rebels who gave their lives so that, that that blueprint, how to destroy the Death Star, could be passed on. And I always remember this scene this guy is stuck and Darth Vader is cutting everyone down and he just says, take it, take it. You know, it's more that kind of knowledge. It's a pressure saving knowledge. It's a relational knowledge. And, and we see this so in so many places in the Gospel of John. I'm just going to take us to a few. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word took on flesh and tabernacled with us. The, the eternal Word became incarnate dwelt with us. And this inscripturated word has its authority in alignment from him. It is his word. And he drew near to us. You know, later we'll read in in, uh, John chapter 17 at the end, I consecrate myself that they may be sanctified in the truth. And Jesus is talking about him being consecrated as a perfect sacrifice so that we to be sanctified by these saving truths that he has given to us in his word. So this is not some kind of like bare technical information like the stuff you read in your vacuum cleaner manual (laughs) or something like that. Uh, This is a love letter. This is glorious. And we see that uh, echoed in what Peter says to Jesus after uh, the sermon um, uh, where um, Jesus feeds the 5,000 and he, he preaches and some disciples are offended by his word. And Jesus turns and says, are you going to leave too? And Peter says to him, where else have we to go? You have the words of eternal life. Not the fun activities. You have the fun activities of you have the, you know, the things that float my boat. You have the words of eternal life. And so this is an invitation, an invitation. Like if you have been living most of your Christian life as though the word, you know, is like that vacuum cleaner manual or whatever, or like IRS text manual or whatever, <laughs> here's an invitation to reconceptualize that. No, this is a love letter from your king to you bought by his blood, paid with his blood, washed with his blood. And as we make sense of all of this, I hope the payoff is that we would find encouragement in whatever kinds of tribulation we're going through, whether it's tribulation for the sake of Christ in a very explicit way or tribulation that we face simply in the midst of living 
in a fallen world. And we spoke about how eternal life is a reality that all who are in Christ experience even in this life. And I want to say that that is really partaking in what we see in verse 22 on the screen. Uh, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. So experiencing eternal life right now in the present is to receive this glory that the Son has graciously given to us and included us in this Trinitarian glory that has now overflowed in a saving way, wrapping up His people. We're still creatures, so the creator-creature distinction is not blurred, so don't get that wrong. Our glorification doesn't mean we become Hercules, okay, like some kind of demigod. We're still creatures, but we are creatures that have been redeemed and are being transformed from one degree of glory to another in the image of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a really hard part. I, I was not really able to keep my emotions in check in the first service, although I think, you know, having done it once, it's a bit easier now. Now, do bear with me if, you know, I, I lack a little bit of clarity in the next moments. Some ex examples of glory that I have witnessed in new life. And I'm, I'm glad, Dennis, you're, you're back here again. And, you know, some of you know Dennis's late wife, Chris Reidenbach. <sighs> and I, I miss Chris so much. Uh, when we first came to town and we didn't know anybody, Chris was like a mother to us, a grandmother to our children. Xu Yan would attend a women's Bible study and Chris would be ever present, you know, taking care of the children. And, and you should know that that's why Xu Yan was helping out in, in the last iteration of the women's Bible study. It's to, to honor Chris and to honor, to honor Christ as Chris did. And our daughter, Natalie, she doesn't talk much. If you've met her, she doesn't really say a lot. But for Chris, she would yell, Miss Chris, Miss Chris. And just Chris just had this gentle, patient way with, uh, with Natalie. And Natalie's a little bit different. I'm glad Beth uh, had that little talk about, um, you know, our brothers and sisters who, who are special and whom we love and whom we honor. And Natalie is a little special, and, and Chris just had a way with her. And then Chris fell sick, and we couldn't see her that often. And, and it was hard to, to face that separation. But even then, you know, in a, in a season of, of deep discouragement, uh, you know, just before I, I, I was due to preach here, I preached here in December 2020, out of nowhere, ping, comes a message into my inbox from Dennis. And, and Chris and, and I are looking forward to seeing you on the live stream and we're praying for you. And even in the midst of fighting life-threatening illness, they, they loved us, they thought of us. If that's not glory, I don't know what is, okay? And... Libby Groves, like she's been a mother to us, and I asked her for permission uh, if I could uh, use this in a, a sermon I preached in another church last year. I assume that that permission is, is standing. <laughs> <laughs> and this is from Al. Al had this, had this statement, you know, and he said this after he was diagnosed with cancer. Nothing has changed. And that was such a rallying call for me to, to read that and to, and to see how this panoramic picture of God's glory had so overflowed and saturated this man's life that even facing cancer, he was able to say, nothing has changed. You know, in 9-11, there was a rallying call that brought hope in the midst of that tragedy. Do you remember what it is? Let's roll. You guys remember that? Let's roll. Now, some of you uh, would have been, maybe not have been alive at the time that the planes crashed into the World Trade Center. 
Now, there were some planes that didn't reach their target. And it's because of the bravery of some of the passengers who retook the plane from the hijackers. And um, I'm thankful for a helpful fact check from Nelson uh, after the first service. Uh, at the leader of, of that, that band of brave volunteers, you know, he got off a, a call with his wife. And his, his last words, let's roll. And nothing has changed is a rallying call to us now, to those of us who are confronted with, you know, these difficult experiences in a fallen world, the loss of loved ones, the deterioration of our own faculties, loss, separation. And it's to remind us that nothing has changed that nothing has changed, that this glory that has overflowed into our salvation is something that we still partake in, even in the midst of the fiercest struggles. All right? And I see that now even in the life of Libby. Oh, there was this story. I was so grumpy one Sunday. You guys ever get grumpy on Sunday? (laughs) Grumpy, 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 grumps. Came into church brought my my son Ruel into the preschool class and what do I see? I see the professor of biblical Hebrew in there on her knees caring for children, caring for little children who may not even know their A's, B's and C's. Wow, that's glory. That's glory. And I'm just so privileged to have witnessed that and to have had this chance to, to live uh, this, this little microcosm of a life with you. Okay, and th- that brings me uh, to the end of uh, basically our, our time in this little section, verses one through five. And I do want to say a little bit by way of encouragement as we, as we look at the rest of, of the passage. So I'm not here to give you good advice, <laughs> but I am here to encourage you as a brother in Christ, all right? And so uh, we could uh, bring up the first point. There's certain things that Jesus prays for here that, that are deeply encouraging in the midst of struggles we face in the, in the church corporately as well as in our personal lives. He prays that we would be united in the truth. Look at this, verse 11. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me that they may be one, even as we are one. And what is this oneness? What is this oneness grounded in? It is not unity for unity's sake. It is not a man-made unity just based on shared interests or shared activities. This is a unity based on the truth of the gospel that has reconciled us to God and also to one another. All right, and... I, I want to say something. I'm not from here, okay? So I, I don't have a right to, to give you a lecture on your politics and that kind of thing. You, you know better than I do. You're more familiar than I do about the tensions that are tearing this country apart. And so the prayer of Christ here gives us great hope. It gives us great hope that our king has prayed for this and is praying for this as part of his heavenly intercession as our eternal high priest. But there's also a kind of pressure here that's exerted on us, a kind of gospel obligation, a responsibility that we would live out the unity that he has called us to and that we would, above all, uh, let the word of God determine that unity, that we would love what he loves and hate what he hates. Second thing, I love Jack Miller. And I've been so encouraged by, you know, those of you who uh, were around in this time and, you know, that you've, you've lived out the Sonship course. Like, I've taken the Sonship course, I've taken Discipleship Lab, but, you know, nothing beats actually doing life with folks who 
who exhibit that glory. You know, Jack Miller used to say, where's your joy? These are tough times, right? I don't want to minimize that. In- inflation, <sighs> war, uncertainty, and all the different personal struggles that, that we have to go through. But there's a bigger picture to that. Joy. Jesus, he despises the shame and he endures the cross. Why? For the joy set before him. And you already participate in that joy. I'm just here to remind you of that. You are already participants in that joy, in that glory, in that eternal life that will someday be brought to its perfect fulfillment and consummation. Third thing. Protection from the devil and being sanctified in truth. I've grouped these two themes together because they're related. When Jesus talks about protection from the devil, when he prays to the Father that we would be protected from the devil, uh, it's very concrete that the way this happens is by us being sanctified in the truth of his word. That we do not sanctify ourselves. It is not out of uh, some kind of man-made, self-generated piety that we are protected from the devil, but it is in resting in trusting and believing in God's truth, in his word. And it is not less than knowing facts. It is not less than knowing true facts. It is not less than knowing true doctrine. But that is in the context of this biblical intimacy and this ongoing conversation and dependence on the Lord, in which we say, Lord, I, I believe help my unbelief. And lastly, fourth point, I pray as Jesus prayed at New Life Glenside, you may have a bold unity in your, in your gospel witness to the Eastern Road Corridor to uh, Philadelphia and Greater Philadelphia that as the world sees your unity, our unity in the gospel that was purchased by Christ, that they too may know that love. And if there's anyone here, whether on the live stream or you know, you're visiting today and you're listening to any of this and you're, you're wondering what's going on, I have a question for you. The question that Nick Foles asked Doug Peterson, do you want Philly Philly? (laughs) Do you want brotherly love? And this is an invitation. You know, if you've never tasted and seen that the Lord is good, this is an invitation to taste and see the graciousness of the Lord, to be wrapped up in this glorious panorama of the glory of the triune God spilling out into our world and wrapping us up in his grace, truth, and love. We will miss you and we will be praying for you. Would you pray with me now? Oh, Father of light, giver of every good gift, uh, we give you honor and praise for who you are in your holiness and perfection. You saw us in our misery and you, and you reached out in concert with the Son and the Spirit. Your triune glory overflowing into our redemption and there's Nothing we could say that could capture the mystery and the wonder and the glory of that. But we want to try, Lord, in the the next moments as we lift our voices to give you praise. And I want to thank you so much for my my brothers and sisters here. I want to thank you so much for the blessing they've been to 
me, to my family. Thank you for the chance to spend this little time with them. Thank you for the gospel partnership that we enjoy, the unity that we enjoy in Christ. And I, I pray and commit New Life Glenside to you, Lord, that even through the mess and the struggle and the difficulties of living in a fallen world, that your truth and your glory may speak louder and shine brighter than that. Lord, if there are any today who, who are coming with heavy hearts, weary hearts, burdened hearts, Lord, would you surround them with those who would love them with the love of Christ, who would image to them the father of the fatherless, who would counsel and help in the power of our helper and counselor, the Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you that you love our church family here at New Life Glenside more than we ever could. And we thank you that as we depart, that we remain united in your bonds of peace. For that, we give you all praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? We'll sing the church is one foundation. Uh, but first, hear from... But first, just hear from uh, the book of Revelation. <laughs> I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel. Revelation 19, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Then the angel said to me, 
write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things. We will say to Very thankful for Kenneth's words today. And if you don't know New Life, just so you know, whenever we receive an international student, we don't make it our aim to bring them to the Eagles. <laughs> but when it happens, <laughs> it's not a result we lament. <laughs> I know Kenneth's affection for you all, new life, and I know it's because God first set his affection on Kenneth, unworthy sinner just like us, 
And when you hear this benediction to end, the affection of God for you in Christ is, is really said three ways. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then the love of God, and then the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Hear this as God's affection for you. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Will you please have a seat for a moment here? And uh, I'll ask you to stay in your seat if you fit this category. If you are a member of New Life and 18 or over, we'd love you to stay.